This next session is talking about the green tin, grid tin and point cloud data. Uh, we're just going through this to give you a bit of an idea of what it means because not too many people quite understand what we're talking about with this grid tin. And it's a chance to test Alan out to see whether or not he actually can get through here without it crashing and doing all sorts of weird things to us. Uh, we actually, Alan and I are doing a couple of demonstrations. No, no so we are really tempting fate. On, on this one. Have you got your mic out? Yeah. So what is, what is a grid string? This is the first thing that's in version 10. All it is is a string which basically has a lot of regular points on it. So it has an origin, a cell size, X and Y cell size, and a range of where they're going to be, and then an angle rotation. So it doesn't have to be like on the uh, screen, it can actually be on an angle. And why on earth have we got them in there? Well. Why people can do things quickly with DEMs, which are, this is what I saw the DEM is, uh, because they're such regular points, it's very easy to do things with them. So really just points. So it's much easier to access them, to do things, because they're not very accurate. A grid's not as accurate like strings. So, uh, but it means we can do things much more quickly with them. So that's what we mean by a grid string. Uh, a grid tin is that same sort of object except it's been triangulated. Now again, because it's such regular data, it's not so hard to triangulate it. So it's uh, very easy to do that process. So it's exactly the same thing. It's an origin, cell size, and then we can use these tri a grid tin just like a normal triangulation. It wasn't me. What happened there? Uh, now, to create these, these items, because once we've got the grid string, a lot of people have been getting DEM data, which is digital elevation models, i.e. it's just a regular grid of data. Now, normally if you went through the triangulation process, that actually can take some time and effort to do it, but because we know it's regular data, it, something goes down about a thousand times faster to go from a DEM straight into a grid string or a grid tin. So things like an ESRI DEM file, it can just come straight through into this format. So if you've been getting that sort of data, it can speed that up immensely over what you were doing. The other sorts of things we use these things are for bringing in LAS data, or in the future it's E57 data. Uh, LAS file, that's a laser, laser file, it might be airborne or point cloud type data. Now the problem with the point cloud data is you get millions and millions of points, and most of them are pretty useless. I mean, what do you do with 10 billion points? Uh, so what happens here is when we read in that data, we basically can set a grid cell size, orientation, that, and as the data comes in, we can average the points in that cell and just end up with one value. So you may have 10 million points, you pick the grid cell size you want, and so as it reads in all the data, it's creating one of these objects which is much faster for us to use. And most of the time, you don't want 10 million points, you're happy with some other object that uh, is much more useful. So a lot of this data you're using is things like terrains, which are undulating and things like that, so it doesn't have to be super, super accurate. The reason why you use strings and not grids, these things have been around forever. When I started working in 1980, DEMs were the big thing. Why did they disappear? Because they're useless for most of our sort of design data. Because you had to make them, you just can't have things like sharp changes of grades and things like that. So they disappeared from the industry. But for things like laser data, and things that undulate and so don't have sharp changes in them, they've been sort of coming back in again. So everything that's old is new again. So in this case, we're using these things for bringing in the uh, laser data to turn it into a grid that you can use much more rapidly. Another way of creating these things is you may have a standard tin. And what you can then do is produce what we call a, a grid string or a grid tin, where it's actually sampling at a regular interval. Now, you were doing this before, people were running this to get data they could put out to other packages that only took a grid. So some of the uh, things like Chewflow, those sort of packages only work with a grid. So in this case, this operation can start with a uh, super tin, a tin or a super tin. And again, it's just saying an origin, a cell size, an angle of rotation, and it just goes and generates. Instead of a whole lot of diff distinct points, though, it'll make a grid string or a grid tin, because then we can work much more rapidly with those. So the whole idea is just to make easy, much faster things we now can do in version 10 if your data suits this sort of thing. If you're trying to do a design where you want very accurate modelling and that, you don't use this sort of stuff. 
it, who wants a grid that's down to a millimetre or something in size? You get so much data that it sort of gets, outweighs the benefits. But for a lot of other data, for uh, course trains and things like that, this is more than accurate and uh, speeds things up for you. Now this is where we are. Uh, this is the danger time. Alan is now going to demonstrate a grid string and a grid tin to show you how easy it is. I will hide. I think Lee figures that if I can do it, then it must be easy. Okay. We're going to uh, read in a couple of files. And uh, the first file I'm going to read is actually a dem file as a grid string. And uh, I've got some SLXs all set up ready to go, so we're just going to read that. And that's the data complete. So we can just start really mousing in. You can see uh, lots of points. It just looks like a normal string. If we go string inquire, you can inquire on those points. But the actual object type itself is actually a grid string. So it means um, it's on a regular mesh. So for example, we can go and, and pick one of these beasts and it'll tell us you know, that was our origin, that's our orientation and the cell size and, and the number of cells that was, that was in there. Um, we'll now do the same operation, but how this time... How many points have we got one of uh, How many points? Huh. Yeah. No wonder I can never get a good demo done with all these disruptions. Uh, that's got uh, 2.3 million points. Um, okay, so if we now will read that same data in, this time as a um, grid tin. So that's where we've got our choice here. We can either read the dem data as we could in V9 as a normal string, a grid string, or a grid tin. So we're now going to read that in instead. Now, I'm not too sure how many people have actually read in the uh, ArcView dem data of this form and then had to spend God knows how many hours trying to null and get all the points correct. But with the grid tin, that's all automatically done. Because we know where the cells are and where they stop and start, that is the tin completed. So we can go to, uh, for example, tin inquire on a height. And for people who don't know, you can leave that field blank and you just wander around. So it's just a normal tin. So had we tried to read that data as a normal string, then triangulate it, and then go to try doing null by angle length, and then all these internal regions may or may not be there, you just end up just wanting to cry. So this just makes it an order of magnitude easier to actually um, to process. And these grid strings and grid tins are they're, they're pretty much like normal tins. For example, if I open up a perspective view and chuck that tin on the view there and fit it and then we'll toggle on Shay, you know, I can orbit in there. Someone keeps telling me orbit's really good. Who's that? So that's a tin. And uh, I'll just close it off. Okay, so now, as Lee mentioned, um, we can create grid tins from um, other tins. So I'm now actually going to start a new grid tin. And what I'm going to do is just say we're going to go at a... Uh, we'll leave the orientation blank and I want to create a new grid tin. And I call it... Uh, oops, conf212. Conf. Conf. Uh. And we're going to interpolate all the Z values from the existing tin. And I want this grid tin to go from here to here. So if we decide, oh, look, it really should be at 20 metre spacing in X and Y, it'll go and do all that for us. And then we just go create. And we we'll, should give it a colour. That'll probably be very handy. And oh. magenta. Now try that. And uh, of course, it does not exist. That's a bug. Excuse moi. And we'll add that tin on the view now. And there's our, our new tin interpolated from our existing tin. So if we had a normal tin with random points, this is how you would now create a, uh, a grid tin, for example, to go out to two flow. And, and maybe Rob's already gives me on that with that's his tomorrow, demo. I'm not tomorrow, too sure. Tomorrow. Okay, that's tomorrow. So, ha, ha, ha. You've now gazumped him. I've now gazumped him. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. So, yes. So that's basically... Um, how easy it is to create uh, grid strings and grid tins. And we can go and edit the existing tin and go, well, you know, 
that's our tin. I may want to change the spacing to back to, uh, back to 10 metres and reinterpolate off the uh, existing tin and update that. So that's now the tin updated with all the triangulation and all the effective nulling done. So if we remove this data, you can see, let me just close that option, where the, um, where the tins have no data, well, those regions are null automatically. So it, it pretty much, we believe, does pretty much the right thing. Okay, so now the reason why we did the, the grid strings first is we'll now go to our next step, which is what Lee mentioned, is about these uh, LAS files or point clouds. So if we now go and read in a, um, an LAS file, so this particular file we've got is just an LAS we're going to put into that particular model. We're not going to try to fence. So if we were trying to select 600 files at once and we had a region that we wanted to uh, restrict on, we can do that. Uh, in this case, we're just going to um, oops, import that as a, did I read the right LAS file or not? As a, as a string. No, I didn't. Duh. Okay, so we're going to read this just in it as LAS points. So we'll go and read that in. That's done. And we'll chuck that uh, LAS string onto the view. Well, that's all the data. So if we do a model info on that data, for the LAS string, that's got uh, about half a million points. Now, these LAS uh, strings or point cloud strings are a little bit different from a normal string in that they always reference the LAS file. Uh, because, because the LAS file is very fixed in structure, it, we can actually get certain efficiencies that we can't get if we were to have them as a normal string. So they act as a string as all intents and purposes, but we reference the LAS file. So you're not doubling up on disk space. And so if you've got large projects where many people want to reference these, uh, it's kind of shared data. Just, just be, uh, whilst we're here, just to, uh, we didn't tell you what computer we're running on here, just in case right. you think there's a supercomputer hiding somewhere. What's the machine you've got there, Al? Uh, it's just a little Dell uh, T3500 with a uh, NVIDIA 2000 graphics card and only 24 gig of RAM and just normal Xeon quad core. Uh, I don't think we've even got hyper threaded. And the drives were just normal blue. Were they just blue? Just, they're not green, they're not which black. Just slow drives. So just Dell. medium 5400 5, RPM drives. Um, so it's just a normal machine that uh, I think we get from Dell for $2,500 or something along those lines. So it's no real uh, rocket ship. Okay, so once we've read in that LAS data, that's all good and well, and you go, well, pfft, now I'm going to go triangulate all those points and blah, 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 and you know, we can go do an inquiry, and that Z value is 746.350. One of the very handy options that we can do with uh, LAS files is when reading the file, we can say, yeah, but look, we really want this data. We're going to read the same file, but this time we're going to, instead of coming in as a LAS string, we are going to convert this data to a grid string on the fly. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, let's just go and run this option and hopefully it should become obvious. And we'll just come back to the U view for a second and add that data on, which is our uh, LAS grid string. So we just get a whole lot of regular points here. Now, for some reason it should have come in, let's make that yellow, so that's going to be a little bit easier to see when I do the next operation. So what's actually happened is we've actually gone and averaged. So basically, at every centre of the grid string, we've gone and looked at all the points around that and averaged the height of all those points. So it's an extremely efficient way of going and filtering tens of millions or hundreds of millions of points, which is totally over-redundant in terms of the, the effective information it contains, and sample it down to something that's very manageable without ever having to bring that data into, into memory. So that's actually um, um, a very efficient way of, of just having a quick look at the data. So for example, if we now go and you know, do a string inquire on that level there, it's going to tell us that it's 746.884 and, and that's 746.90. Now the third operation we can do is we can, again, read this data in again, but this time we'll do it as a grid tin. And 
same information and this will probably just give us the, uh, a much better feel for what we've done. So we put this regular grid chin and you can see it's regular by the fact that the, the triangles are always effectively in a rectangular cell and that's those, all those points have been converted to that tin basically instantaneously. So if we come up to the top here, we should see... Oh, no, we're not going to see that. OK. I was hoping we could see some shearing where if there was no points in certain regions, then you would not get triangles. So if you had a, a horseshoe-shaped uh, point cloud, for example. So that's the... Um, that's effectively all what grid tins are about. And you know, we can... Again, it's, as I say, it's a normal tin. We can put that onto a perspective view and toggle the shade on and then use Peter Tayton's beloved orbit. Look at that. Isn't that good? Oops. We go back to a bit. <laughs> he uses it better than me, obviously. I'm... So that's just um, effectively um, grid strings and grid tins. Sorry to disappoint you, Lee. We'll actually be continuing this on day three in the future directions to show you some of the things we've been working on getting ready for version 11 to do with point clouds and things. So unfortunately, our examples in there, the point clouds had colour in them. So we'll probably show one of those on, uh, uh, on, yeah. uh, on Tuesday as well. So we will continue.